it is the floor mine? The floor is yours. Okay, wonderful. So uh, thank you again for the invite and the chance to share some stories from Madison and, and beyond. Um, I'll start here. This is sort of my, my title slide here in this picture. And I think this picture sort of embodies what I think about atmospheric chemistry and some of the challenges that the community faces when we try to understand chemical processes that happen in the environment and what we need to do to actually go out and make those observations. And so this picture here is a picture that my graduate student, uh, former graduate student, uh, Michelle Kim took uh, in the North Atlantic Ocean during uh, a relatively large storm. And what we were trying to look at, and this is part of the story that I'll tell today, is how the atmosphere and the ocean are connected and how processes, whether they be chemical or physical or, or biological in the surface ocean, act to control the transfer of small particulates. I'll talk about those a lot, little aerosol particles, or uh, trace gases. Um, that are formed through biochemical processes in the surface ocean waters and, and how they might exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere. And if you wanted to study that process, you can imagine the various scales you would look at that. You can think about something you might make in the laboratory which would replicate this. But if you ultimately want to get after that question, you sometimes have to actually go there. And so um, this is part of that study. And so this, this uh, figure that I put up now in the bottom right-hand corner shows a ship track. And so that's where this research vessel uh, uh, carried itself along this experiment. So it started in Greenland and made its way ultimately to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in, uh, in Massachusetts. And so today, what I want to talk about is a little bit about atmospheric chemistry that happens in these in these types of environments and how we might be able to distill or reduce some of the complexity of this question and study it in the laboratory. So um, I'm going to target probably trying to talk for maybe 35 or 40 minutes uh, so that we've got some a good opportunity for questions and uh, discussion at the end of this so I'm not just remotely uh, talking to you guys. So sort of to get everyone up to speed here, uh, I recognize most, most folks probably haven't had an atmospheric chemistry or, or an environmental chemistry class uh, in, in a lot of detail. So uh, the, a large focus of today's uh, talk is about atmospheric aerosol particles. And so this is material that's suspended in air um, and it can have a size, these small particulates, they can have a size that ranges anywhere from uh, a few nanometers in diameter that might really be like a small little molecular cluster all the way out to a, almost like a rain droplet. And they can be formed through a lot of different ways. You can form them through um, mechanical processes like I'm showing in this upper left-hand corner, like this mineral dust. So this dust storm, these are all particulate in this dust storm of exceedingly high concentrations to what I'll talk about today is, is sea spray, so how you can make particulates through breaking waves at the surface of the ocean, to urban smog, so sort of a classic picture of any of the major uh, industrial centers in the United States or, be, or, or beyond that have this haze, and that haze is primarily the suspended particulates, um, and then the contributors to this urban smog that can be vehicles or such. Um, and so this larger picture here I show is sort of a histogram or a, a size distribution. So this is the number of particles uh, at a given size. And so you can see that particles, they, they tend to find themselves into a peak that's around 100 nanometers. So that's sort of a calibration scale to think about in terms of these particles, about 100 nanometers. And, and why you have that is because things that are much smaller than that, than 100 nanometers, they're almost like gases. They, they, they move by diffusion and uh, they collide with larger particles and they can be lost from the atmosphere through those processes. And things that are bigger are, are removed from the atmosphere basically by gravity itself. So they move like rocks. So particles move like gases when they're small and they move like rocks when they're big. And so the, the lifetime of particles in the atmosphere that are really small or really big is pretty short. And so you end up with these things that are around 100 nanometers. Okay, so why do I care about these things, right? I mean, you might ask me, okay, how many particles actually are there in a unit volume of, say, a centimeter cubed? And 
and remote parts of the world, there might only be like 100, 100 particles per centimeter cubed. In an urban area, or that is dust storms, there could be uh, tens of thousands. Um, and so we're interested in it from a health standpoint. So the, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, has a, a, a federal standard for particulate matter. And the reason for that is because these particles are small enough at 100 nanometers that if you did like a fluid dynamics experiment, you could calculate their trajectory uh, as you inhale an air mass. And at 100 nanometers, they're going to make it all the way down and deep into your lung tissue and embed into the lungs. And so they're sort of a carrier or a conduit for toxins to be able to uh, leave the atmosphere and enter the bloodstream through this process. So, uh, so t if we want to assess exposure, um, we really want to be able to measure these particles and know where they come from and where they go. Um, on top of that, the World Health Organization um, uh, in 2004, they, they claimed, and this was not our study, but the World Health Organization says about one in eight total global deaths is a result of air pollution exposure through some process, right? And that could be, of course, it leading to uh, the enhancement of, of a, uh, another disease. Um, but this understanding uh, aerosol particles and some of these other toxins in the atmosphere, of course, is of, of increasing importance, especially globally. So that's one reason. Um, the other reason we're really interested in particles is because sort of from that picture I showed two slides ago, I'm gonna move back here, this urban smog or even this vehicle exhaust is what you can see is that the presence of the particles acts to attenuate or scatter light. And that's important in the context of climate because if there are a lot of particles out there, they can scatter solar light, so solar radiation from the sun back to space and that changes the uh, radiation budget for Earth. But the other thing that they can do is that they can actually act to change the formation and the lifetime of clouds. And that's a really important process that aerosol particles play is that they serve to nucleate clouds. And I can so, sort of have a lot of text here and we can talk about text, but one of the most interesting ways you can see that is this picture on the right. Um, and uh, this picture here I, you know, it's not important where exactly it is, but the blue that you see underneath these white clouds is the ocean, and you see these white stripes here, right? Here's, a, here's one here, there's one there. Those are ship tracks. So at the start of each one of these, there's a large-scale uh, vessel, and it's emitting sulfur, sulfur dioxide, and the precursors to these particles. So what you're seeing here is actually cloud formation that's induced by the particles that are being emitted. And so... Of course, if you wanted to understand the amount of energy that's reaching the Earth's surface or being reflected back to space, you'd want to know if this pixel in your picture of Earth was white or blue based upon how much light goes in and out. And so that's a really important part is thinking about uh, how they serve as these nuclei. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is, is the surface of the ocean. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for doing this. Uh, one is that about 70% of Earth's surface is covered by oceans. Um, the second is that there are not many measurements over the oceans. So as, a, as an experimentalist that is interested in measuring things through field observations, it's, it's a challenge to get out into the middle of the ocean if it's the Atlantic, Pacific, or Southern Ocean. And so the measurements that we have to constrain a model or constrain a, a mechanism are, are usually much more sparse. Um, the third point here is that there's a large contrast in color between an ocean surface and a cloud, right? So this deep blue color of the ocean and this white of the cloud. So in terms of the amount of sunlight that might be reflected, there's a, there's a large impact if you have a cloud there or not. Um, and then the last one is that if we really want to understand the impact of things like human activities on climate, we want to understand what climate was like before we started to influence it. And so we want to think about things like what, what did clouds look like over the oceans before we started building large-scale cities and things like that. Okay, so this picture here, um, what I'm trying to highlight here is I, I'm coming back to the same graph here, which was number of particles versus their size, this little black line. And what I ultimately want to know is how do particles get there? So what might be the source of those particles from the ocean? How fast might they go back to the ocean? How might some particles be transported into this maybe view box over the ocean from another source, or how fast are they removed? And then are there any really interesting chemical processes 
that might serve to change how big a particle is, right? Are there reactions that can sort of chew away, chomp away that particle? Um, or are there processes that might add mass to that particle that change the shape of that thing? So those are sort of, in a, in a grand scheme, what we ultimately want to know. You want to get to a chemical mechanism. You want to get to a production rate or a loss rate for things that you could put into one of these large-scale chemistry or climate models. Okay. So... For, for my talk here, for the next uh, little bit here, I have a, a couple points that I want to try to look at. Um, one is I, I want to ask this question about basically how big are sea spray aerosol particles? And uh, it looks like I got cut off here. This, of course, what, what factors might impact this? Um, what a fraction of sea spray aerosol particles can nucleate clouds? So is a particle that comes off the ocean surface, is that something that's really good at, at making a cloud? Um, just based upon what the chemicals are in that particle, or is it not very good? How would we measure that, or how would we know that? And then the last thing we'll talk a little bit about, if we have time, are, are some of these trace gases that come off the ocean surface, right? So for those of you, you know, that spent time near the oceans, there's a smell of the ocean, right? You can kind of smell the ocean. That's, that molecule you're smelling is dimethyl sulfide. It's a, it's a pretty strong... Uh, strong scent, even at relatively low concentration. So what, what do things like that that come off the surface of the ocean, what do they do when they're oxidized uh, in time? Okay, so just as a sort of a starting place for this, how are these particles made? And why might somebody that's a chemist be interested in this, given that what most of us know is that the ocean is salty? So maybe just sea spray particles are salty, right? Well, what's interesting about sea spray and the way in which it's made um, is that it's, it's a reflection of the chemical composition of the surface ocean water itself. And when I say the surface ocean, I'm really talking about the top millimeter or even uh, smaller than that. Um, because what's happening during the formation of these sea spray particles is you normally have a wave that breaks in the open part of the ocean and it entrains air into the surface ocean, creating a small scale bubble plume. And as those bubbles uh, reach a depth in the surface ocean, they return back to the surface, they scavenge organic material. So they scavenge all types of surfactants um, and uh, organic molecules that will, uh, will be attached to the bubble interface. And sort of guiding you into this top figure here is as that bubble reaches the interface, sort of in this millimeter or so range, you get this formation of all these little small particulates. And they end up being, in very high concentrations, a reflection of the organic material that was scavenged through the water column, or that that sits right on the surface of the ocean. And so these particulates that are formed through that bursting of that little film cap, sort of like what happens uh, in your kitchen sink or what happens in the bathtub, right, when you have a, a film that, uh, that, um, that builds up, is those little particles that burst, they end up being really rich in organics. And then as a second step, sort of similar to what you might see if you see raindrops impacting on a puddle or raindrops impacting on a lake, you often see this little jet recoil, right, that comes from the base of that um, of that open capsule. And those things are more of a reflection of the bulk ocean. But what's neat about this is you, can, you have a way to make small particulates. So these things, when they're little droplets, they might be you know, microns in diameter, and then they evaporate the water, and they become really small in size. And you can make really big droplets as well. Um, and chemically, they can, be very, uh, they can be very diverse. They don't necessarily reflect this sort of bulk depth system of the open ocean. Okay, so that's sort of the first step is that how do you make these aerosol particles from breaking waves? The second question I wanted to, to bring up here is, well, is a particle a good nuclei for a cloud? Um, and to understand this, there's really two principles from sort of your general chemistry or from your physical chemistry background that would guide you to making a very rude uh, approximation about whether a small particulate is a good nuclei for a cloud. So does water accumulate onto that particle rapidly and grow into a cloud or not? Um, and the first one has to do with how big the particle is. And this has, is related to uh, the Kelvin effect. And this is that the vapor pressure over a curved surface is higher than that over a flat surface. So if you have a really small particle, it's actually hard to put water molecules on that. It's hard to grow up that, that particle. As opposed to a really big particle, that, that surface, um, the vapor pressure over that 
um, can become a little bit lower. So in general, really small particles, things that might be tens of nanometers, they're not very good cloud nuclei. They want to be bigger than that. The second thing is right from general chemistry as well is Raoult's law, and that uh, tells us that the vapor pressure of water depends on the number of soluble moles that are in the system. So particles that are made of insoluble material, they're not very good uh, cloud nuclei. Things that are made of very soluble things like salts, like sodium chloride or ammonium sulfate, they're really good, they're really good at being cloud nuclei. So sort of the bottom line of this applications of some general chemistry or physical chemistry things into atmospheric chemistry is that large aerosol particles that are composed of soluble material, like maybe sodium chloride, they're really good cloud condensation nuclei. Small ones, not so much. And so when we start to get into this question of what is a sea spray particle, we want to know how big they are, and we want to know what they're made out of to assess whether or not they'd be good at making a cloud or not. Okay. And so how do we ask that question? And so I introduced this talk showing some fancy pictures of us out in the middle of the ocean and um, how we can learn from being out in the middle of the ocean. And it, it turns out that sometimes in the, in the modern era here, going into the middle of the ocean, even if you go into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, even if I you know, take a research vessel and I go right out here, it's, it's really hard to get away from pollution. And the time that it takes for air pollution to move from here, Madison or so, um, uh, out into that middle of the ocean, um, it's, it's actually not that long on these sort of horizontal transport times, right? So if you even were to take a research vessel and go out to the middle of the Atlantic and you were to sample some of these particles, um, it's hard to say that they're just from the ocean surface there because the lifetime of some of those particles in that size of 100 nanometers could be about a week. Um, and so those particles, they can go around the Northern Hemisphere in almost two weeks. So even if you went to the middle of the North Atlantic, um, you might just be sampling things from the East Coast. Um, so one of the things we, we think a lot about in, in our group is thinking about how we can replicate these processes in the laboratory. And so sort of as that first step, this is, this is a laboratory experiment. <laughs> so this is what I think about as a laboratory experiment. This is a, a wave channel, and it's actually linear. The picture here that shows this sort of curve is an artifact of the, of the picture. Um, and this, is, this wave channel is a way of generating a breaking wave in ocean water in the laboratory. So we can change all the different parameters and we can study exactly what those particles look like, how big they are, what they're made out of, and we can assess whether or not they grow to be a cloud nuclei in a controlled setting. So let me just sort of guide you through this. This is at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, and so this is in... Uh, this, this line here is probably less than half a mile from the ocean. And it's actually, there is uh, one of the interesting features of Scripps Ocean, uh, Institution of Oceanography is that you have tap water, but you also have seawater. So you have a tap of seawater. And so you can actually fill up these large scale tanks with seawater. Um, and so this is right on that pipeline. And so the ocean water gets filled into this tank. And right at the end here, there's a hydraulic paddle. And that creates a, a wave that comes, that traverses through this tank, and we have a false beach in this region. The wave actually breaks. We force the wave to break, and you get a large-scale foam patch afterwards, so just in the same way that it breaks in the open ocean. And then all these little pipes that you see coming into this headspace are connected to instruments all in front of this, okay? And so these are all different types of mass spectrometers. They're different types of scattering instruments that study the particles and the gases that come out of this tank. And so what I'm going to talk about in this talk is a little bit about the particles that are in here and uh, how big they are, what controls their size, and whether or not they grow to be these cloud nuclei. Okay, so this is sort of the idea. And so this experiment here is a large-scale collaboration that's run out of an NSF center for the Center for Aerosol Impacts on Climate and the Environment. Um, and so for any of those of you that are interested in thinking forward about graduate school and thinking forward about uh, chemistry and its applications into environmental chemistry, I, I really encourage you to look up this center. It's a, a large-scale um, uh, endeavor that focuses on these things. And this really is a large uh, collaboration, not just amongst chemists, but also folks that think about the, uh, about the physics and the biology of the surface ocean. These are two of those folks, Grant uh, Dean and Dale Stokes. Okay, so the first thing we do here is we think about, do we need to go to all this trouble of making breaking waves in the laboratory, or could we just take like a little frit and 
and blow air through it and get the same thing. Um, and so what I'm showing here, this is a picture of a breaking wave in the laboratory. So you can see sort of this complex physical process versus one of these little frits that you might push air through and make bubbles in this way. And what I'm showing in this graph here is this is the, think about this as just a number of bubbles at a given size. And this gray thing here is this breaking wave. And what's really important about doing this in a wave channel is that you get bubbles of all kinds of different sizes. And especially you get these things way out here, these really large bubbles. And those become very important in thinking about particles that are formed from these larger bubbles. Um, and if you just did this simple experiment, like something you could literally do in the bathtub, uh, you'd get a lot of these smaller bubbles. But you basically, when you get to here, you don't get any more. You, you, you miss this larger tail. And so if we look at that in terms of the size of the, now the particles, not the bubbles. So here we're looking at the size of the particles. And this you can think about as just the histogram or the number of those particles. Though the size of the particles from a breaking wave or this gray line here, and those from this sort of easy experiment of, the, of these little frits and glass frits is this red thing here. So the red curve is a really tight, narrow distribution of really small particles. And the actual breaking wave gives you this large distribution of, um, of particulates. And so already, hopefully, you should be start thinking, wow, if I want to know about whether or not these two sources would give a different number of uh, or a different potential to form a cloud, they probably would because this guy over here generates a lot of big particles. This one, not so much. And this, of course, is what's the replica of what's happening in the atmosphere or at the ocean surface. Okay. So... So sort of onto some measurements. So this idea of does it form a cloud is kind of a nebulous thing, right? Probably to you guys right now, you're thinking, how, how do they know if it's going to form a cloud or not, right? They're in the laboratory. And so we actually have, a, have an instrument that um, we call, it's a, it's a size resolve cloud condensation nuclei system. And basically what it is, is it's a chamber in the laboratory that simulates the process of growing a cloud, okay? So when a cloud forms, primarily what, how it forms is that air is lifted in the atmosphere and cooled to the point that the water vapor that's there is super saturated, the relative humidity is above 100, and those, that water vapor starts to condense onto things, right? And the things that it condenses onto are those particles. So we, we actually try to do that in the laboratory. So we have some source of these aerosol particles, and the first thing we do is we select their size, okay? So we want to know how big they are. Are they 10 nanometers, or are they 100 nanometers, or are they a micron in size? And so what we do is we do something that's very similar to sort of a large scale mass spec is that we charge the particles and then we inject them into an electric field. And so we can move them based upon their mass to charge ratio, right? So instead of looking at ions, uh, instead we're here looking at larger scale particles. They move in the same way. They move with respect to their mass to charge ratio. And so we can tune the electric field in these types of instruments, right? So we can bring these sample particles in and we bring them into this region here where there's a central high voltage rod. And based upon the charge that's carried by that particle and its size, uh, some of those particles will be attracted to that rod and some of those particles will be less attracted to that rod. And there's a small window of those particles that will have a stable trajectory that positions them right in the exhaust line that can then be taken out and counted. And so what we can do is in a similar way to uh, in mass spectrometry, we can scan the voltages, right? So in this case, we're just scanning a high voltage uh, rod here, and we can scan the particle size range that can go through this exit here. So that tells us basically how many particles there are of a given size. And then the second thing we do, so it's sort of we have some source, we size select them, we count the total. The other ones we send to basically a fake cloud chamber. And so it brings the particles in and it subjects that particle stream to a given amount of water vapor. And that given amount of water vapor is trying to replicate a cloud, right? So it's trying to replicate what I had said before is, is an air parcel or a, a volume of air that has a, has a relative humidity that's above 100%. So water is starting to condense out of it. And in clouds, you know, in clouds that you see around... Um, around your hometown or clouds that you might see over the ocean, it's, it's rare that the relative humidity is actually that much more than 100%. It's usually about like 
or 100.2. Um, if you get to 100.5 or so, relative humidity almost, water will condense on almost anything. Okay, so it's the very subtle changes in that. We call that a supersaturation. We call it above 100% as a supersaturation. So what this instrument allows us to do is we can count how many particles are, are actually cloud condensation nuclei if they were exposed to these types of conditions versus how many are total. So you might count three to five. So 60% of those particles would go on and form a cloud if they were subjected to those conditions. So it's kind of a nice measurement that's applicable to the system itself. Okay, so sort of um, you can bear with me here a little bit as we sort of step through this. So I'm going to step through this pretty slowly here, and I want to bring you up to this left-hand figure here, so this red distribution. This is what you would get a size of particles from these, these, this fake way of generating sea spray, these sintered glass filters. And what you'd find is that the really big particles, if these are salts like sodium chloride, is that these really big particles would go and become clouds if you had a supersaturation of water, so this would be relative humidity of 100.1, is that anything that was bigger than about 115 nanometers, that would activate to be a cloud, okay? And if I were to integrate this peak, right, so if I were just take the area in this little triangle here, that's about 20% or so. So 20% of the particles out there become a cloud. So that's, that's pretty good. If I had a wetter condition, so if it was 100.2% relative humidity, that number goes down. So all the particles that are um, 66 or so nanometers in size or larger can become a cloud, right? Because there's just more water vapor, so you can overcome those competing Kelvin effects that we talked about before. So it's basically the area under here. And that area is about 40 or 50% or so. So as you increase the amount of water that's available, you can increase the number of particles that would grow to be a cloud droplet. So eventually, if you get to really, really wet conditions where it's 101%, even very, very small particles would activate to be a cloud. Okay, So that's sort of what we're interested in. This axis here, X, that's controlled by the atmosphere. The atmosphere might say that in the marine clouds, this is what the atmosphere is. It's, it's rarely way out here. Usually it's down in here, maybe 0.2%. And so these particles that you would generate from a glass filter, they don't look like they're very good cloud condensation nuclei. So if you informed an entire global model that this was the size of those particles coming off the ocean surface, then you would really under represent how many of those particles would go on and serve as a cloud nuclei, as opposed to this gray thing here, right? Those particles are much bigger, right? So the, the fraction of the area here that's above that critical diameter becomes a lot, lot bigger, right? And so the sort of the first conclusion here about size of the particles is it really matters how big these particles are. And, and if you want to replicate a, a challenging environmental condition, you really need to replicate the whole physical process uh, alone. So this uh, picture here, sort of that first conclusion there is that, that um, we want to know what the size of these particles are. And that actually has one of the biggest effects on the uh, cl uh, cloud formation in marine environments is just basically how big those particles are. Okay. So the second thing someone might think is, okay, we just did this nice experiment, it's just about the size of the particles, right? Just from salts, it was just from sodium chloride itself. We didn't talk about whether or not those particles were composed of different things, right? And so what's really neat about this wave channel is that we can then take that water from the ocean and we can do a large scale biology experiment in it. So we can grow up phytoplankton cultures within that wave channel. We can change the chemical composition of the surface water and we can look to see whether or not the number of particles that come out of the ocean change in response to that. And that would be a really interesting number to know, right? If large scale algal blooms in the surface ocean change the number of particles formed. And you might be able to uh, rationalize that, right? When you're when you're in the uh, when you're doing your dishes, right, and you add soap to the um, to the reservoir to the to the sink, you get a standing foam, right? And we know that that standing foam is a result primarily of the surfactant molecules in soap, and so the foam is stabilized by those surfactants. And a similar thing may happen in the ocean, right? You have a a, a large scale phytoplankton bloom that may go on to form all kinds of lipids and things like that that could 
have a similar effect. And so it's an interesting question to ask is, do large-scale phytoplankton blooms in the ocean change the number of particles or the size of those particles? And so this sort of, uh, this figure here is a figure in time. So uh, the x-axis here is just time in days. And this is from that wave channel experiment. And this orange line here, so starting with that, is the chlorophyll concentration in the water. So you can see it's pretty variable and it sort of plummets down here. And then a, a phytoplankton bloom grows in and this thing goes off scale. It actually switches axes here and goes even further off scale. So this is basically what happens oftentimes in the open ocean is that you have these large scale cycles in phytoplankton. You actually can observe that from space. You can measure ocean color from space and get a handle on these things. And so what we wanted to do was to look at whether or not the size of the particles changed or if the number of the particles changed during this really large scale event in chlorophyll. So you'd basically be looking at what is the size of particles here and the number of them versus the size of the particles here and the number of them. This would be a really extreme algal bloom in the ocean. And this colored figure here is again time and y-axis of size of those particles. They're all kind of falling in this 100 to 200 nanometers. And the color is how many particles there are. And what you see from this figure is it's, it's, it's almost insensitive to this change, both in terms of the number of particles that were formed and the size of those particles. And so one of the major conclusions from this was that the particle concentration and the, and the diameter of those, they, they're, they're really insensitive to these changes in the concentration of things like chlorophyll in the water. So the initial size is very important in describing that accurately, but it doesn't vary a whole lot in places that you go. Okay. The next thing you might think about is, well, when we're trying to connect this, these particles of a given size, maybe the composition, the chemical composition those particles has uh, is, a, is at play, right? And uh, to this point, I've just described it as, as seawater, right? But in reality, we know that seawater has, uh, has a chloride concentration that's in the vicinity of 500 millimolar, and it has some other trace ions in there as well, like magnesium and calcium and the tens of millimolar. And then it has a lot of organic material that at least in the, in the ocean itself is relatively dilute. Uh, the carbon content of the ocean is on the micromolar scale, maybe ranging up to three or 400 micromolar carbon in a large scale phytoplankton bloom. And so you might not expect that the particles formed from that matrix would actually have a high concentration of organic. But it turns out that's not actually uh, not actually true because they're formed from that film at the surface of the ocean. And so this picture here, this is a microscopy image here, and um, this is an X-ray microscopy image here. That's um, a scan and tunning X-ray microscopy image that allows us to look at the carbon uh, content of individual particles. So each one of these individual little blobs here is a sea spray particle. These are these are primarily in the size range of a couple hundred nanometers. And what we're looking at here is just the carbon. And so you can see some of these particles have these really thick carbon rings. You know, this is just the carbon, so it's likely a carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen matrix there. And then on the inside, uh, there's not a lot of carbon. This one you can actually see almost is square, showing you that it's probably, that's the sodium chloride uh, uh, cubic uh, structure that's right inside there. So these particles, their mixture is of, of sea salts, but also with these organics. And sort of the question is, what do these organics do? I, I told you the second part of that cloud formation story was Raoult's law, right? So what happens if you add in some insoluble organic material? And so you can go through and you can measure the types of molecules that show up. So the first picture there was just looking at the carbon content, but you can take these particles and you can do some mass spec on them and look at some of these individual components. And you find that they're rich in, in all kinds of different small molecules to large molecules. They're dense in sugars and sterols and lipids and proteins and even larger scales, scale things like lipopolysaccharides. Um, and so the question is, what, what impact does the composition of these organic films, what does that have on the ability of a particle to, uh, to take up to take up water and act as a cloud nuclei, nuclei. Okay, so we can do this experiment as well. We can do this in a couple different ways. Uh, we can do this in the wave channel, right? And we can go out and we can measure this. We can measure the, the number of CCN and we can measure the number of these total particles and actually make that determination like what I was showing in those figures. We can do that in our wave channel. We can also do these in these these tanks that simulate wave breaking process as well. It sort of is a recirculating plunging 
um, a waterfall in each one of these. We can also go out into the open ocean itself and do something very similar to this. This here is uh, a, an instrument that's operated by, uh, by NOAA in Seattle and by Trish Quinn and Tim Bates up there. And what they do is they take this thing, they call it the sea sweep and there's some hoses connected to this thing and they float this off the edge of a boat and they basically have this process here, these, these plunging sheets into the surface ocean itself and try to catch the particles that are formed through that. So you can go in these, these various different pathways and move far beyond just looking at just salt and see what effect this has. Okay, so, um, okay. so we'll skip right to this uh, conclusion. So this is the same type of plot that I showed before here. So when, thing, when the air mass gets really wet here, almost everything grows up to be a particle. And uh, down here, where you have a range of actual relative humidities of the clouds, fewer things happen that way. And what you find from this is if you generated something from pure salts, this dashed gray line here all the way at the top, that's what we found in that first experiment I described. And then as you made things more complex by either doing these really uh, high concentrations of chlorophyll and this phytoplankton bloom, or actually going out into the open ocean and measuring particles born at that interface, you find that the effect of the chemistry acts to lower it a little bit. That's what you would expect, right? That's the, the Raoult term there. But it doesn't lower it that much, okay? So the effect of the chemical composition of the particles, that's around 20%. So even if you get into a large-scale phytoplankton bloom, you might expect there to be a little bit of a reduction in that. But perhaps not be a driving factor, okay? So those are sort of the, the first two things that I talked about. I talked about two things I, in those, uh, uh, those opening slides. I talked about whether or not the size of a particle born from the surface of the ocean mattered, and the answer is, is, is yes, it matters how big those particles are, and that's due to that Kelvin effect, so the vapor pressure over a curved surface over, versus that over a flat one. And the Next thing I talked about was whether or not the chemical composition mattered, and the answer was yes, but subtle, okay? So uh, as, as an atmospheric chemist, we, we spend a lot of time talking to larger scale researchers and thinking with them about whether or not the processes we might describe in the laboratory can be captured through satellite measurements and things like that. And so if you go into the literature and you look at, you look for these types of relationships, so the impact of ocean chemistry on clouds, the first thing that somebody from the satellite community might try to look at was they take an x-axis here, which is the chlorophyll concentration of the ocean. So that's sort of a measure of the biological activity of that surface water. And they'd look to see if the cloud drop number, so the number of cloud droplets changed with that, uh, that um, that dependent variable. And so a couple hypotheses could be drawn from this, right? You could say from one, you could say, well, the measurements that, you know, that uh, Dr. Bertram just talked about is, he said, well, if you change the amount of chlorophyll, the number of particles and the, and the size of those particles doesn't change all that much. So maybe you'd expect this to be a flat line. That would be a good hypothesis. Um, the second one you could say is, well, uh, he also told us that if you increase the chlorophyll concentration, that those particles have more organic material, and that impacts that Raoult term. So, so maybe the number of particles actually goes down as you increase, the, as things become more biologically active. And so it's, of course, a surprise and of interest when the measurements from satellites over the open oceans give you a relationship that looks something like this, where the number of droplets, cloud droplets, actually increases very strongly with the concentration of chlorophyll in the surface ocean. Um, and so this is sort of the second part of the talk. So I'll sort of hope I'll spend the next um, uh, maybe 10 minutes talking about this is how, how, does, how, how can we explain this type of picture or what might be some of the factors that go into this type of relationship based upon not just the particles themselves that are formed, but maybe some of those trace gases that come out of the ocean themselves, and how might we look to address that? Okay, so I'm going to come back to this slide here that I started with. This was this 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 number of particles and the size of those particles. And beforehand, I had all these arrows saying particles are formed at the surface of the ocean and they're lost to the surface ocean. Particles come in maybe from pollution and they're blown out of the box. 
and there's some chemistry that happens. And now what I'm looking at now is it's not just particles formed at the surface of the ocean. There's all kinds of trace gases, like that dimethyl sulfide molecule that you smell as being the, the signature of the ocean. And those are emitted into the atmosphere and they're oxidized. And what happens to them when they're oxidized? Do they, do they start adding, uh, when they're oxidized, does their vapor pressure change? And do they start to condense out onto this distribution? Or what, what really happens to that? What do we know? Um, and so that's the, the third part of this talk. Okay. So this question comes back to um, uh, science that, that's been talked about since the mid-80s and primarily been talked about in the context of one molecule. And that one molecule is, is the molecule I've been referencing throughout um, our discussion today, dimethyl sulfide. And the focus of that, of course, has been because it's what you smell. Um, but we know, of course, through uh, studies of biochemical mechanisms and, and processes that are associated with phytoplankton, and with their degradation is that it's not just dimethyl sulfide that's formed. There's all kinds of other organic uh, molecules. Many of them are not very soluble that are also formed in the surface ocean. And those are things like monoterpenes and isoprene and even sesquiterpenes, um, just as a flavor. There's lots of other components of that. Um, and when they're emitted to, this, to the ocean, from the ocean to the atmosphere, of course, they're emitted into a highly oxidizing environment and they're oxidized, right? So these monoterpenes, you can do really interesting oxidation processes where uh, you can start to open up this ring through attack by ozone, right? So those of you that have had your organic chemistry can actually draw out the formation of that primary ozonide and how that thing uh, starts to open up and ultimately start to form molecules like the C's, pinic acids and things like that where you can serve the central four-member ring. You get these molecules that have extremely low vapor pressures um, the sulfur co compounds, ultimately, many of those end up as sulfuric acid or methane sulfonic acid. And these low vapor pressure compounds are of interest to us in atmospheric chemistry because they can condense onto any existing surface area upon that collision, and they can grow the size of particles, or some of them can actually nucleate their own, right? So if, they're, if their vapor pressure is low enough and some of the, you can start to have an acid-base reaction between these and the reduced nitrogen in the atmosphere, they start to grow up particles themselves. And so you can have a completely different pathway toward changing those particles that might be much more responsive to the biogeochemistry of the surface ocean. Okay, so there's a couple ways we can address that question in this sort of continuum of a laboratory experiment to a field experiment. And so you can imagine something simplistic where you take a, take a flask and you take your favorite monoculture of, of algae or bacteria or whatever that happens to be, and you, uh, you basically monitor the headspace, monitor the trace gases in the headspace. And you might be able to come up with a number of, there's X moles per gram of chlorophyll per day produced, or moles per cell per day produced. And believe it or not, experiments like these can actually be used all the way up into large-scale climate models to assess those connections. Um, a second way you can do that is through a sort of a mesocosm type experiment. We can might imagine going out into a fjord like this and putting up a little uh, encapsular, a little tent over the ocean surface and measuring the trace gases coming out into that little tent. So these are very specific uh, type experiments in, in both cases in regions that are close to shorelines, okay? And what I wanna talk about here is, is what my group has done to try to complement this perspective and give it a little bit more scope. Um, and so the previous studies, a lot of them, what, what you could generate from them is you could generate knowledge about what organic compounds might be formed, but it's very hard to scale up to at what rate are they emitted from the ocean surface itself. And so that's where this picture comes back into focus, and specifically the role of my graduate student here, uh, Michelle Kim. And so what she did was an experiment where she took a chemical ionization mass spectrometer that we had built and engineered um, over the past five years or so, and connected this up. So it's basically, it's in this little C container down here. You can see this black umbilical that comes all the way up here to this, what we call diving board. And it samples trace gases from the atmosphere, brings them down into this mass spectrometer and measures them at a rate of about 10 hertz. So you get 10 measurements a second. And the other thing up here is this little 
uh, box you can kind of see up in this corner here. And this is an anemometer. And this, make, this permits us to measure the wind speed. And if you can measure wind speed really fast, and you can measure the concentration of a gas really fast, what you can ultimately do is measure the concentration of a gas in a downdraft in the atmosphere relative to the concentration in an updraft in the atmosphere. And that tells you about the process that happened as that air mass swept the interface. And, and after some you know, series of Fourier transforms and a bunch of other math, you can actually calculate out an emission rate from the surface by measuring wind fast and chemical comp composition fast. Okay. And so sort of how we do this is we have to measure it fast for these small molecules. So we can't exactly take a canister and evacuate it and trap these molecules and then bring them back to a laboratory. We have to make the measurement on site um, and we want to make a measurement that's fast and specific. And so chemical ionization becomes a really important and helpful tool in doing that. And so instead of doing an ionization process like electron impact, where you might uh, put a lot of energy through the, um, the attachment of electron onto an existing molecule and lead to fragmentation of that, we do a very soft and selective ionization. So either a charge transfer process or make an adduct between the analyte we're looking at and the molecule and, the, and the, the reagent ion that we're ionizing it with. So we can actually look at some of these large uh, uh, molecules without breaking them apart, and we can measure them at exceedingly low concentrations on the fly like this. So this is a, this is a, a time of flight mass spectrometer. Uh, the actual detection axis of this, the, the mass spec side of this, is about the size of a shoebox, and the TOF on that is a, is a custom design that's built out of this uh, company, TOFWork, in, in in Switzerland in a collaboration with Aerodyne in, in Boston, we put together this instrument um, that can measure these trace gases down into the sub uh, single digit part per trillion uh, levels for each one of these really interesting molecules. Okay, so, so what did we do with this and, and what did we learn from this? Um, and so now what I'm showing you is the coming kind of full circle to my title slide and this, this sampling measurement. So now what I'm showing is a, a, a higher resolution map of this North Atlantic region. So this is Greenland, and this is the ship track. So this is the ship coming down through here. And the ship track now, all these little dots is colored by chlorophyll. So it's the concentration of chlorophyll, and uh, that's measured from the ship. And then some of this background coloring here is that chlorophyll concentration. That's actually measured from space and bringing us back in around the corner. And so this is the research vessel that we were on doing this. This is the RV NOR. And so sort of that, that um, diving board was right up here. And that shipping container with the mass spectrometer was right in this region here. So it kind of gives you a perspective on these, uh, on these instruments. Okay. So what do we measure? One of the things that we went after this was to say, well, this, the molecules coming off the surface ocean are probably not just dimethyl sulfide. They're probably all kinds of other interesting organic molecules. Um, and the short answer to this is that's exactly what you find, is not only... Do, you, do we measure things like dimethyl sulfide coming off? We actually measure a, a large concentration of things like monoterpenes, so things like alpha pinene and beta pinene that have known production pathways um, from, a, from an array of, of plankton species. And we can measure the concentration of them. So you can see a couple hundred parts per trillion. And we can also measure the flux. So this is the molecules per centimeter squared, so surface area per second. And that comes from that relationship between wind speed and concentration. So you actually get a number that's really helpful for scaling to a large scale model is how many molecules are coming off the surface ocean. That's something that would be of incredible value to try to stitch these stories back together. And of course, these measurements, they start to build up the, uh, the array of knowledge, both concentration spaces and flux spaces for our interpretation. Um, so what makes this molecule so neat? Why why as a chemist am I interested in looking at things like this? And the first reason here is, like I said before, is that things like monoterpenes, their lifetime is actually quite short in the atmosphere. There's an abundance of ozone in the surface layer that can add right onto that double bond, break that apart, and you end up making these really low vapor pressure compounds quite quickly. Um, and those particles, those low vapor pressure particles, or low vapor pressure compounds, they can either nucleate new particles, so you get a whole bunch more particles that could be important for cloud condensation, or they can just add mass to the existing size distribution and make those particles bigger. And that's probably the most important thing they can do is make particles, existing particles, bigger so that they can be better cloud nuclei. And so 
sort of moving forward, where do we go with this information, is that we can take um, all of this type of information on the size of particles that are coming from the ocean, what they're made out of, the rate at which they're being produced from the ocean surface, and we can combine that with information on the trace gases that are coming off the ocean surface as well, and we can combine those two pieces of information together to really understand the net effect of things like ocean biogeochemistry on particles and particles on clouds themselves. And so that's sort of the, where this talk would transition into a larger scale research side talk is thinking about what, how do we take that information? How do we actually, how do we feed that into a larger scale chemical transport model or global climate model? Okay, so I'll, I'll stop with that part here and also I always want to acknowledge all of the people that actually do the work. I get the, the luxury of talking about the work and organizing lots of things, but it's really the graduate students that are, in the, that are on the research vessels and doing all of this stuff as well as the undergraduates. And uh, draw your attention to three people here, Steve Schill, a current graduate student of mine who's done a lot of work on, on looking at aerosol particles and their growth. Um, this is uh, Matt Zorb, a former uh, postdoc of mine who's now faculty at Cal State San Luis Obispo, um, who did a lot of work on building some of these mass spectrometers and deploying them to research aircraft like he's on here with Steve or to these research vessels. And uh, Michelle Kim, who uh, is now a postdoc at Caltech um, and uh, did much of the field work on this. Um, and then combined with that, of course, the funding agencies that make this all possible, primarily the National Science Foundation and the Chemical Center for uh, the uh, aerosol impacts on climate and the environment. So I'll stop there. Hopefully we've got 10 minutes or so um, to be able to have some questions or so, or a few minutes, uh, depending on availability. So remember to give your name. Over here first. State your name. Hello, my name is Allie. I was wondering, um, do the types or sizes of the particles affect what kinds of clouds form or like where they are in the atmosphere? Yeah, okay, so that's a good question. The uh, question of does the size, the type, do, they, do the particles impact the type of clouds that are formed? Um, the answer is absolutely. Um, and and the, the coarse distinction I would make is between warm clouds and ice clouds. So most of what I talk about today today are warm clouds, so they're, they're liquid clouds. Um, but what becomes a really interesting area of atmospheric chemistry is the formation of ice clouds and ice particles or mixed phase clouds. And the formation of ice clouds is very sensitive to the, actually, the composition and the structure of the, of the particle surface itself. And so you're really trying to template an ice uh, an ice interface. And so you can really almost start to think about the lattice structure of ice and what at the surface would, would be a good template for that. So it becomes a very selective process, but your question is right on point in that the, the particle uh, size and composition can start to drive the types of clouds in this coarse definition of warm versus ice or cold, cold clouds. Yeah. Hello, my name is Irene, and I was just thinking in terms of uh, water composition, we have a lot of uh, rising concerns for pollution, especially oil spills and uh, fertilization over spills into the ocean. How might these affect the production of small particles for climate? Uh, again, that's a good question. Um, what, one thing, unfortunately, we have the opportunity to study this in detail with the Deepwater Horizon um, issues. And so um, uh, in the aftermath of that and those large scale oil slicks, um, there were a number of research aircraft that actually went out into those regions and studied particle formation and the evaporation of the organics that were coming out of there. So that's sort of the extreme, of course, endpoint of your question, not the more subtle um, uh, pollution that's continuous. Um, and, and it has an impact, actually has a pretty large impact, uh, largely because many of the organics that get deposited through an oil slick or something like that are, are surface active, right? You see them in the, in the oil slicks. And so when you have a wave breaking event, those molecules are transported very efficiently into the aerosol phase because they're so enriched or enhanced at the interface. And so it would certainly lead to a, a change in the particle number 
uh, 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 flux, I would expect in these really dense regions. Um, but it's an interesting question, certainly something that these types of wave channel experiments are well designed to, to look into. Hello, my name is Dylan Zimmerman. I'm a little bit interested in that huge facility you were talking about um, huh? where you generate the artificial waves. Do you only look at one local sample of seawater? Like how do you manage um, contaminants either in the air or when you go from different samples? Yeah, uh, again, great, great points here. The, um, so the, the air we can control much better. So what you could see in those pictures is that the, the wave channel um, was fully enclosed. And what you couldn't see in there is that we have basically a very controlled high vax system um, that controls the headspace. So we have all different types of filters that are on the inlet stream of that, both to remove out trace gases and small particles. So we have a good way to control the air headspace. Now, the water we're pulling directly from coastal ocean water. Um, and so this is not sam this is sampled basically from, uh, you know, maybe 150 or 200 meters out into the ocean, but it's coastal ocean water. It's, it's not water that's taken from the, 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 the Southern Ocean or the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, these are very specifically, uh, this experiment is looking at those coastal waters. So you get what you get, right? Uh, if you had a large scale rain event in Southern California, which doesn't happen very often, although it's happening right now, uh, you'd get runoff into the, the coastal regions and you'd sample that runoff water. So you do need to be careful about that. Um, the volume of that tank is so large that it's actually quite hard to think about putting representative seawater samples from other parts of the ocean into it. And so to that end, we've built smaller tanks that we think also replicate the processes reasonably well that might be, you know, on the scale of 50 liters of water as opposed to, you know, tens of thousands of liters of water. Um, the other thing that we can do is that you can also, um, you can take cultures of, of phytoplankton or bacteria and you can build back the mesocosm itself. Um, and so you can try to even rebuild the Southern Ocean in the laboratory by taking cultures of the, of the dominant plankton from those regions. Hi, my name is Helen. And I also had a question about um, the laboratory methods for uh -huh. your research. So um, I know that you were showing us a different a method to create the breaking waves and also the sea spray. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering how you determine the parameters yeah. uh, to really the, what parameters, parameters you consider in order to create sea spray that's most like the one that you would see in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, again, you guys are coming out with great questions. I always appreciate this. Um, so this, this facility wouldn't work if it was just me and a bunch of chemists going to try to do this. Um, this facility works because we have the constant discussion with physical oceanographers. And so these two folks that I showed there, Grant, um, um, uh, Grant and Dale, uh, they are physical oceanographers that study wave breaking processes in the open ocean. And so they actually go out into the open ocean, they put on their wetsuits, they go in subsurface, and they measure the bubble size distributions uh, in breaking waves all over the world. And we take that distribution and try to replicate it in the breaking wave that you have in the lab. And so we actually you know, I didn't talk too much about it, but we have, there's different frequencies in which you could drive that hydraulic paddle and you can make brave wakes. We can make waves break in different ways, like an open ocean spilling breaker versus a very energetic coastal breaking wave. Um, and so in terms of trying to replicate even just the physical process, uh, it has to be in discussion with people that understand how it works in the open ocean. Uh, and the, you know, the same can be said for the biological processes as well. So I have a question that's um, generated by a student, Danielle. Uh, she had to leave, but she wanted to know to what extent does aerosol pollution actually have an effect on the ozone layer? Is there? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, aerosol particles that are formed at the surface they don't have a very long lifetime. They've got a lifetime, I think I said before, that might be seven to 10 days or so. 
And the time that it takes for air from the surface to get all the way up to the stratosphere where the ozone layer is, uh, is much longer than that. So most of the pollution aerosols that are formed at the surface don't make their way up into the stratosphere and impact those processes. Um, but of course, many of the gases that are much longer lived, like of course the problematic chlorofluorocarbons, the reason why they had such an impact on, on ozone chemistry is because their lifetime is sufficiently long to get them all the way up into that region. Okay. All right. Um, I don't think we have any more questions here. Do we? Oh, okay. uh, just a quick question. You were showing that image of how you could see the um, clouds being formed by uh, that transport ship and the exhaust. Yeah. Um, does, does there a similar effect with um, airline um, planes and that sort of thing? Right. So, right. So, um, I mean, you, you see contrails, of course, you know, routinely, and that's, that, um, that is primarily looking at the, the, the water vapor condensation on that. Um, they disperse really, really quite rapidly. Um, so the persistence of these things that you see from the ships is, is much, much, much longer. And the, the flux of things coming out of the, the large scale ships is so much higher than what you would expect from an aircraft uh, that burns relatively clean. Most of the, the source of the particles that are coming from the ships is primarily because they're permitted to burn very high sulfur content fuel when they're in the open ocean. Um, when they come into ports, they, they're by requirement, they have to reduce that sulfur content. Um, so that effect goes down a little bit, but in comparison to, you know, jet A uh, fuel. I see. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Tim, do you have um, research summer opportunities for undergrads? Yeah, we have research summer opportunities. Uh, if folks that are interested in these things, uh, we actually have a, a, a re summer opportunity that's similar to an REU program that's through the Case Center. So, and I, I can send you a link to that if you'd like to distribute it. Um, and that brings, that's a program, it's about the size of an REU, 10 to 12 students distributed to, uh, there's a number of folks that are in Madison, there's some that are in San Diego, to work on topics just like what I talked about today. Cool. Very nice. All right. I want to thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.